I, on behalf of Fort Walla Walla Museum and the Fort Walla Walla Board, I would like to welcome you to the Fort Walla Walla Museum. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, supporting this uh, after hours program, but I also appreciate your longtime support of the museum. It has, uh, this museum has grown into a regional museum. It's not just the county museum any longer. It's a very, very different museum than when I first arrived here in 1978. So it is truly a phenomenal uh, museum. And if you've never wandered through uh, the many aspects of this museum, please do. It's worth it. I want to uh, thank you for coming. And this evening, uh, we're going to look at the history of College Place, Washington. It is unique in all of Washington State because of how it developed and who developed it. And so we're going to explore that. And so we will start out. If we could kill these lights right here, that would be great. In the beginning here, because nowhere in southeast or eastern Washington just appeared. And the Walla Walla Valley and the entire Snake River and Columbia system were largely created by floodwaters. And it's the Missoula floods that swept through here. And over uh, repeated flood episodes, they now believe maybe as many as 100 different floods struck this area. And this is Wallula Gap. And this is the area that caused the backup that flooded into the Walla Walla River Basin. And it came in and it uh, dropped out lust soils and silts. And on a lot of the hills to the north of us and some in the valley, there's large erratics that came with those floodwaters and huge chunks of ice from Lake Missoula. And the lake was formed up around Missoula by a large ice dam that flowed and formed uh, by, from the ice sheet that stretched out of the Arctic. And when this sheet of ice rotted, the dam broke and the water flooded across eastern Washington and went down the Columbia River, flooded the Willamette Valley, and swept out to the Pacific. And that was a repeated event. And so this is where the Walla Walla Valley got its water from for uh, thousands of years back up would flood into the Walla Walla Valley. So it's uh, truly an amazing event. So this is Wallula Gap. This film, this picture was taken in 1924. And you can see the twin sisters right there. And uh, this was long before the dams. And there's big sandbars in the middle of the river. And what happened was, as time proceeded, more and more bars would form in the Columbia River as floods occurred. And then the Walla Walla River, the Yakima River, also contributed large amounts of uh, bed load in sand and silts, forming all of these big sandbars in the river. At the end of the summer, oftentimes there were big dust storms that would blow sand off those islands. And if you've ever been in western Walla Walla County, there's dune systems all over, out along Britain Road and Atkins Road and all the roads that are in western Walla Walla County. And that is sand that has blown off the Columbia River over thousands of years. And it has accumulated there. And that was the beginning of the western portion of the Palouse in Walla Walla County. So, the first peoples, I want to talk about the tribes for a bit. They were the first people to settle in this section of uh, the world. And they settled in the Walla Walla Valley because it was full of springs, seeps, and water. Lots of it. And the tribes that settled here, the resident tribes, were in fact the Cayuse, the Walla Walla, and the Umatilla. And the Cayuse were the 
were the tribal uh, folks that settled in this valley. The Umatilla and the Walla Walla were much closer to the Columbia River and their primary tribal lands were not immediately in this valley. So these are members of the Walla Walla tribe and um, this picture was taken in 1889 in Walla Walla. And I would love to find that painting in the background of the teepees and tribes because it was at a photo shop known as McFadden's Photoshop. And I would love to know what happened to that. The, the tribes here were very interesting because there was one tribe that did not speak Sahaptan. They were the Cayuse. And the Cayuse spoke their own language, and it was called Cayuse. And this was one of their war chiefs by the name of Yellowbird, and he had another name. Does anyone know what his other name was? Piu Piu Moxbox. And Chief Piu Piu Moxbox was a very important member of the Cayuse tribe. Prior to the Battle of Walla Walla and prior to the Whitman Massacre, he had his eldest son murdered just outside of Whitman Mission. And there was a, that was a huge misunderstanding. And uh, Chief Mox Mox did not seek revenge against the individual that murdered his son. But he decided what he would do was uh, he would negotiate. And so he realized that there was no way that the Cayuse tribe was going to be able to take on the advancing Western Europeans that were moving into the area and that he, they needed to figure out some way of living and coexisting. So Chief Yellowbird uh, tried to talk and get this fixed. And, and there were a lot of members of the Cayuse tribe that were not happy about what had happened, and they were not happy about trying to live with the whites that were moving in. So Yellowbird uh, was present uh, when the Whitmans were uh, killed and the other uh, members of the area, and uh, he did not take part in that. Instead, he walked out to Fort Walla Walla with a group of uh, other Cayuse members to uh, seek refuge in the fort because he wanted no part of what was happening. And he was murdered as he stood outside the fort. So, <laughs> I look at this gentleman and I think of what he witnessed in his lifetime staggering amount of change. And his language, Cayuse, is now an extinct language. It's gone. And the reason I put this in College Places History is because College Places History starts right here. It starts because the first Western Europeans arrived and the Whitmans set up their mission in 1836 and in 1854, the next missionaries arrived, and those were two French Catholic priests, and they set up St. Rose of Lima Mission, just to the northwest of Whitman Mission. And with them came about 200 Matisse, who were half Indian, half French. And they were starting to farm around St. Rose of Lima Mission. And then in the early 1870s, the first Italians arrived. And they were looking for land, and they wanted to farm. And there was a gentleman that showed up, and he arrived with the United States Army in uh, 1857. And uh, his name was Frank Orselli. Frank was a trooper at Fort Walla Walla and he mustered out of the military in 1857, purchased some land from the government, and started his own vineyard, and had a apple orchard. 
And so he was the first settler uh, that actually had a, a farm that he was selling his produce from. And he sold it largely to the troopers that he had just mustered out of. And um, so Frank was a, a very entrepreneurial individual. And then the first settlers in really interested settlers arrived. This is a very young Nelson Blaylock. And Dr. Blaylock came here to be a doctor. And he ended up owning vast tracts of land and he built his farms right over what is now College Place. He had orchards and grow crops and he had a fair number of people that worked for him. And there, at the time, there was a large number of immigrants that were coming in, and they were either Italian or Chinese. And the Chinese arrived to help put the railroads in, and they were getting paid, and they were shipping a lot of their pay that they received back to China to the family in China. But they were treated horribly in this county. And at the time, Walla Walla County was the single largest county in North America. It covered 110,000 square miles. It stretched from Skamania County all the way to the crest of the Rocky Mountains. So it was all of Eastern uh, Washington, most of Idaho, and clear to the Western Montana. So it was a huge county. So I jokingly tell our county commissioners, we want our county back. <laughs> so anyway, so it was a huge county and it was part of the Washington Territory. So Dr. Blaylock was a gentleman that had great foresight and he saw something happening. He was informed by the Presbyterians that they were going to build a college in Walla Walla. And he was the mayor of Walla Walla. And then he was contacted by the Seventh-day Adventists and they informed him they were going to build a college in College Place. Well, there was no College Place at the time, absolutely none. But they wanted to build a college on what was known at the time as Sunflower Hill. And so he said, I will give you 40 acres to build your college on with one stipulation. And that is, if the college fails in less than 25 years, you have to purchase the land at fair market value. And so immediately, three leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church stepped forward within a day of his offer and said they would cover the cost should the college fail. And they all signed promissory notes and he gave them the land. So in 1891, they started to plan for the building of Walla Walla College. The interesting thing was, there was already an Adventist educational institution in Milton, Oregon, and it was called the Milton Academy. And it was a three-story brick building, and it had high school and secondary school in it. And the top floor wasn't even being used. So they came to those leaders of the Adventist church here in this area and said, why don't you put your college in down at Milton and we will uh, charge you rent. And you, can, you don't have to build a college. It, it's already built. And the people that wanted to build the college here said, no, we want a college. We have been told by the church leadership to build the college right on this spot, and that's what we're going to do. So they told the Milton Academy folks, we're not going to take up your offer. We're going ahead and building our own college. Well, that created a riff between the Milton Academy and the people up here, the Adventists here. And so Dr. Blaylock then sold an additional 30 acres to uh, 
Walla Walla College and the Seventh-day Adventist Church to build a larger facility. And they started their planning on what they were going to build. And in 18, the end of 1891, they were building like mad. Now, this area started to build up. There were now, by 1892, there were 25 homes that had already been built around what was going to be a new college. And these were both faculty, staff, and student families that moved here to go to school. And then the college uh, faculty and leadership announced that they were also going to um, accept secondary students and high school students, and they would all go to school in the new college administration building. Well, you know what that did? That killed the Milton Academy. And the, all those students came up from Milton Academy, and as soon as Walla Walla College building was built, uh, here's Blaylock's Orchard, and those are some of the homes that were built around the site of future Walla Walla College. And I got this photo from Whitman College, uh, thanks to them, to their, from their archives. And Dr. Blaylock was an extremely clever gentleman because he knew that a college would anchor a town. And he knew that the next college was the Presbyterian College, Whitman College. And he wanted two colleges here because that would anchor this community. And it would do it forever in his mind. And so he uh, had uh, in excess of 600 acres he grew produce on and trees. The Italians arrived. And the gentleman on the right is Pasquale Saturno. The gentleman on the left is Joseph Tesci. And they were cousins. And they started their own business. And it was a truck farm. Only there were no trucks. So it was a buckboard farm. And they brought their families. And Mr. Saturno and Mr. Tesci uh, really set to work. Now, the amazing thing was, at the same time that they arrived, there were about 5,000 Chinese that lived here. And they were truck farmers, buckboard farmers, and they were growing row crops and vegetables. But the US federal government had made a law, congressional law, that Chinese could not own property. They could not be out after dark. They could not own a single building in the United States. And so they had to rent everything that they utilized. And the Chinese in this area lived around what is now Myra Road and into what is now Eastern College Place. And some lived on the grounds that later became the US military fort. And they had to move down to where we now have the country club. And that was all part of Chinese rented lands. So they came here to help build the railroad that Dorsey Baker was punching through to Wallula Gap. And they worked very hard. They sent their money home. And by 1950, there were 50 Chinese left in the Walla Walla Valley. They were so mistreated. So what happened next was the Italians had no such limitations on them, and they could purchase property, and they did. And we still have many of the families that Pasquale Saturno and Joe Tesci had come from Italy. And they came here with the agreement with Mr. Saturno that they had to work for him for six or seven years and then he would make sure they had their own property and he would give it to them so they could start their own businesses and their own farms. And so they did. And he brought 90 Italian families from both Northern Italy 
and southern Italy. So they were very different Italians. And the Italians that settled in and around what became College Place were called the Cabrisi. And they were from Sicily and southern Italy. And the Milanese, or from Milan, were from northern Italy. And they settled in what is now Walla Walla. And so Mr. Saturno and Mr. Tesci were uh, Cabrisi. And they were very successful. They understood salesmanship. And they understood how to build on their business. And not only were their employees hired to increase the amount of land and the profits of their company, but those employees knew that they were going to end up with three or four acres themselves. At this time, a gentleman arrived. He was a French soldier, and he had mustered out of the French army in Europe, and he was on his way to America because he understood it was the land of opportunity. And he came down through Sicily, and when he was in Sicily, he was sold these onion starts. And he thought, well, I'll take them with me. And he came to the United States, came out on a wagon, and lost his wagon, and bought a horse, and came the rest of the way on horseback. His name has been lost to history. We do not know his name. I could not find any evidence of what his name was. But he brought the Walla Walla sweet onion to this valley and planted it. Nobody paid attention to what he had planted. And after three years, suddenly this big, delicious onion appeared on the market. And suddenly, Mr. Saturno and Mr. Tesci said, what is this? Where did this come from? And this French soldier, ex-soldier said, well, I got the starts in Sicily and this soil just grows these beautiful sweet onions. And they became extremely interested in this onion as well. And to this day, many of the former employees of the Saturno Tesci company still grow Walla Walla sweet onions in this valley, their descendants. So it's very important. They started something that put this valley on the map, and that was the Walla Walla Sweet Onion. So the next thing that happened was, oh, and I need to tell you, Mr. Tesci uh, died in a wagon accident when he was 36 years old. And so Mr. Saturno lost his partner. And he was uh, shook and grieved Mr. Tesci for many years. And um, so this is the gentleman that moved here to College Place in uh, 1889. And he decided he would become the postmaster. And his name was Henry Carnahan. And Henry Carnahan built himself a home, and he put the post office in his basement. And people would bring their letters, but he said to the citizens of the area, there was no city of College Place, he says, I have to have an address, a town's name on that envelope to get it here. What are we going to call this place? And no one had any idea. We don't know what to call it. And finally he said, I'm calling it College Place. We have a college and it's a place, that's the name. And it stuck. So in 1891, he named it College Place. So Henry Carnahan is the guy that came up with the name and uh, it's stuck and it's still here. So Henry Carnahan was in his 80s when this photo was taken in 1945. And he was an incredible individual because for years and years and years, he was not even paid by the Postal Service because he had taken it upon himself to start collecting postage, postal uh, mail and sending it on. 
And after he named it College Place, it became much easier to get mail to people in this area. So, another thing he did was he urged them to incorporate the town. And everyone said, not a chance. We don't want any incorporation because they will charge taxes. They will have government and they will have regulations and we don't want any of that. And so he said, yeah, but I think you're going to want to incorporate. And the, the citizens that lived here said, absolutely not. Sure, we can call it College Place, but we're not becoming a town. So the next thing that happened was a doctor and Mrs. Dunlap came to College Place. And the college was now almost finished. And they built this a sanitarium. And it was built where Smith Hall sits on College Avenue and Whitman Drive, right on the hill where the uh, library sits. And it was this beautiful big sanitarium because there was a tremendous outbreak of tuberculosis. And so they came from Battle Creek, Michigan. And he was a trained physician and his wife was a trained RN and they worked like mad to uh, get people well and to try to eliminate the tuberculosis outbreak here. This valley has been nailed by one epidemic after another epidemic, and I'll talk briefly about those. Walla Walla College in 1901. The college was finished on December 7th, 1892 and they opened up the basement was yet to be finished it was not finished in any way it was rough and when the students arrived there were nine faculty and 101 students and they weren't all college students they were secondary from the uh, Milton Academy and high school students from the Milton Academy so they all went to school in the basement of the still uh, unfinished building. The problem was Walla Walla College was there on the thinnest of financial ice. They had very little money and they were worried about how they were going to continue and uh, provide an education to people. So they were really concerned. This is uh, a 1911, that's what the college looked like. And by then it had three buildings. There was a farrier, a bakery, a broom shop, and the college. And students could work in those three businesses and go to school and then um, they lived in the community. There were no dorms. And so this was an impressive structure and what happened was, in that time frame, we had severe winters here, where the snow was four, three to four feet deep every winter. It would go down below 20 below, and it was really cold. So they had students that would go out all summer and fall and collect firewood. And then, once uh, the railroad uh, was completed, they were able to get coal to, uh, on the rail line to Walla Walla College, and they started burning coal. So the college continued to grow, and here's what it looked like in 1915. And uh, by this time, they had 22 faculty and 285 students, and it kept growing. And it was only after 1915 that their financial base uh, stabilized and they were doing much better. And I love this photo and I'm sorry that the computer deal's on there, but it, this was taken in uh, 1918, the end of World War I. And this was now a prospering college and the community had grown to almost 900 people that lived around and in College Place. 
But they had another thing that started happening, and that was buildings started burning down because wood buildings burn and people are not careful. And they had no fire department. They had no way of keeping these fires at bay. So this group of citizens got together, purchased a 250 gallon water tank, a wood water tank, and it was a pumper and 500 feet a hose. And they would go hit this gong when a fire started and everyone would come out and help put the fire out. Well, the college lost buildings, the community was losing buildings, wood buildings, businesses were burning up, and uh, they got another call from a small group of citizens that said, we need to incorporate. And the rest of the citizens said, not on your life. We're not paying taxes. We're not being told what to do. We're not going to do it. And so this gentleman came along. His father started the city of Milton. His name was Dorsey Nichols. And his father came, built a, a cabin on the South Fork of the Walla Walla River and then started, helped start the city of Milton, Oregon. And his son, Dorsey, said, there's too many nickels here. I'm moving north. I'm going to go live up by the college. So when Dorsey Nichols got to College Place in 1881, he built a dry goods store. And it was the only dry goods store in College Place. And it was sizable. And he had two sons that helped him run it. And he was an amazing guy. He decided that uh, the College Place area needed to incorporate. <laughs> bad, bad idea. And so um, he also decided that he was going to be open on Sundays. Well, at the time, the Washington Territory had blue laws. And these were laws that said you do not break the Sabbath by opening your business. It is illegal in the Washington Territories and in the state of Washington. And Dorsey Baker, or Dorsey Nichols said, I worshiped on Sabbath. And the law was written, it said Sabbath, not Sunday. It said Sabbath. So he went to worship on Saturday, his Sabbath. And lo and behold, someone told the state police that he had opened his business on Sunday and he ended up getting fined and he got taken to the Washington State Supreme Court because he fought the ticket. And his attorney was a gentleman named Mr. Sharpstein from Walla Walla. <laughs> And Mr. Sharpstein was Jewish, worshiped on the Sabbath, and he said that the state was in violation of the 14th Amendment. And he took it to the Supreme Court of the new state of Washington. And he argued before the judges that they were in violation of the 14th Amendment and they could not deny Dorsey Nichols from opening his store. Well, the judge disagreed with him and fined Dorsey Nichols $25 and sent him packing. Two months later, Mr. Sharpstein got in trouble with the blue laws because he was starting a baseball league. And every Sunday afternoon, he would play baseball. And that was breaking the Sabbath. And he was uh, narked on. And this group of pastors in Walla Walla said that he had broken the Sunday law and he could not continue to play baseball on Sunday afternoons. So Mr. Sharpstein ended up before the state Supreme Court again. And he said that he was Jewish. He worshiped on Saturday. He had worshiped on his Sabbath. And that was the way it was. And they were still in uh, complete, uh, they were out of whack with the 14th Amendment. So, uh, the same judge 
gave him a $25 fine and said, go back to Walla Walla. So <laughs> Mr. Sharpstein uh, was a little miffed, went back to Walla Walla and decided to just keep playing baseball on Sunday afternoon. 1908, the state legislature enacted much more stringent blue laws in the state of Washington. And this time, they did not give out any, uh, business, didn't allow any businesses to be open on Sundays in the state. And that didn't go over with a lot of business groups, and it definitely didn't go over in the city of College Place, which was still not a city. So, uh, the blue laws were eventually uh, gotten rid of because of Citizens in College Place and four business organizations in the state of Washington took it to court and got a referendum on the ballot. And it wasn't, this did not happen until 1966. So for 57 years after the second blue laws that were enacted took 57 years to eliminate those blue laws. This is the man that started the fight. So Dorsey Nichols did something. He sold his dry goods business to the college and it became known as the college store. So this building was built in uh, 1890 uh, down on uh, what is now uh, Quail, uh, the uh, estates, down to the east of Walmart. And it was the Walla Walla County Poor Farm. And it had a home for indigent older people. It had a clinic and it had a food uh, feeding program for the down and out. It also had a cemetery, and the last burial there was in 1942, and there are now over 700 graves that are associated with the poor farm. Uh, and at the time, it was run by Walla Walla County. And eventually, the city of College Place ended up with that land. And I have had the good fortune of sitting on the Historic Preservation Commission for the city of College Place. And we just did some ground penetrating radar to find out how many actual graves are there. And it is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So the thing that is amazing about this structure is that it was cared for by the citizens of Walla Walla County. And then eventually, after 1947, the citizens of College Place took over and they took care of the indigent at that facility. And it closed in 1967. This is downtown College Place in 1930. And that road there was not called College Avenue. It was called the Roosevelt Highway. It was named in honor of Theodore Roosevelt because many, many people admired Theodore Roosevelt for his actions and what he had done as president in 1905, 1909. And they liked him. And so they named this highway that came up out of Oregon, went through College Place, and eventually hooked into Walla Walla and went north. The amazing thing is, You'll notice there are businesses as far down that street as you can see. It had, College Place had 40 businesses along the Roosevelt Highway. And they were all kinds of businesses. And the interesting thing was, it was a booming town. Another thing that happened during this period was, there was a group of people plotting to get the town incorporated. <laughs> that fight was ongoing. And in 1931, College Place was hit by a massive flood. It washed through the city of Walla Walla into College Place, and everyone sitting on College Avenue had three and a half feet of water in their homes and in their businesses. 
and it was a major flood. And that's when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, was asked to come in and they started building the Mill Creek Channel and rip-wrapping the Walla Walla River because they had to control flooding. It damaged many, many, many homes and businesses. But because College Place was not an incorporated city, there was no money to help them. And they had to recover on their own. This was the logo that was designed for the city of College Place in 1949. And it was still the logo when I arrived here to go to college in 1978. And it is there for a very specific reason. Because the citizens of College Place had a massive celebration at the 100th anniversary of the arrival of the Whitmans at Whitman Mission. In November of 1936, College Place admired the Whitmans and what their sacrifice was, and they admired what they were trying to do among the tribes. And many of the citizens of College Place were missionaries or had been missionaries, and they understood mission. And they really had a place of high honor for the Whitmans. And so in 1936, there was this massive celebration in College Place at Whitman Mission site, and it was not then a monument. And the old bits and tumble down parts of Whitman Mission were still there. And so it was uh, really something, and it was a major deal. It was really important to them. This is downtown College Place uh, in 1950, and these two fire trucks were the pride and joy of town. So what happened was, in December of 1946, the group that had been strategizing and planning to incorporate College Place met. They said, let's do it. And so they had a referendum of the people that lived in the College Place area, and they won. And all those that were opposed to it were led by a dentist who was a Seventh-day Adventist. And all the other people that voted in favor of incorporation did so because of a fire that had occurred in November of that year at the Williams Lumber Yard. The whole lumber yard burned down for the second time. And there was a gentleman named Walter Bunch and another gentleman named Austin Morgan. And these two guys, along with Dorsey Nichols, said, let's incorporate. We cannot remain a hamlet with no government. And all those that were opposed said, we're not going to be told what to do. We're not going to be taxed. We refuse to do that. And they said, all right. We'll have a vote. And when the vote came out, a, those in favor of incorporation won. So that December, they went to the Walla Walla County Commissioners, and the county commissioners said it'll be the first thing on our docket in January. And so in 1947, the county commissioners signed the ordinance creating the city of College Place. And Dorsey Nichols was one of the first councilmen, and Walter Bunch was the first mayor of College Place. And they had, suddenly, they had a government. And yes, they charged taxes, but they had a fire department. They had a single police officer. They had um, all kinds of infrastructure built, including a sewage system. And it eliminated loads and loads of outhouses. <laughs> so what happened was, in the 1930s and 40s, a typhoid fever hit College Place, the citizens of the area, because everyone had their own outhouse, and all of that E. coli had silted down into the shallow aquifer where they had their drinking water wells, and they drank it. 
and lots and lots of people got typhoid fever. And they were sick as dogs, and several died from it. And once they got rid of all of the outhouses and started a sewage system and a sewage plant, suddenly typhoid wasn't an issue anymore. So those people that lost the referendum whined and complained about being told what to do. So <laughs> Walter Bunch called them the cats. It was like herding cats. In fact, his son wrote a book about College Place called Herding Cats. <laughs> and it's about the citizenry of College Place in the early days of the town and how they behaved because they thought they could overturn the election. And I thought, where have I heard all this before? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, it went on and on, and finally they realized the city of College Place was not going away. And so, it continued to grow. And the next postmaster of College Place was Dorsey Nichols. And he is the one that was instrumental in getting this post office built, because he too had the post office in the back of his store. And when he sold the store to Walla Walla College, he had to move the post office. And this was the building the federal government built for the College Place post office. Do you guys recognize that building? It sits right on the corner of College Avenue and right across from the parking lot near the Alumni Center. That's it. This is College Place's first traffic light. And those are the two College Place public works people. And they're admiring the installation of their traffic light. <laughs> so they were very excited about that because it showed that College Place was building and growing. This was the sanitarium, a second sanitarium that was built and eventually sold to Walla Walla College and it became known as Preston Hall and it became a girl's dorm. And in 1932, it burnt to the ground. So the college had it like 14 months before it burned. So this is Totem Out Market, which is the building that sits just to the south of Andy's Market right now. And when I arrived here, uh, I grew up in Southeast Africa, and my dad came back to school here in 1970 to finish a degree, and when we arrived, Totem Out Market was the market. There was no Andy's Market in 1970. And it was owned by the Blair family. And the Blairs ran Totem Out Market from 1959 to 1970. And the amazing thing was, um, they sold it to another couple in 1959, and this other couple had it for about two months when two armed robbers came into the store and held them up and were trying to empty the till. Someone tipped off the lone college place marshal and he came running in, shot one of the criminals dead on sight and they started shooting back at him and he was shooting at the remaining one, wounded him and he captured that last uh, holdup guy and Tim Blair told me that there were bullet puck marks all over in that store from that event. <laughs> and he said from then on, he was six years old, he said whenever citizens would come in to shop at Totem Out Market, they had to go on the bullet hole tour. And he would take them around the store, showing them the puck marks in the wall where all these bullets hit. Anyway, Totem Out was a favorite of the kids in the community because they sold bazooka bubble gum. And it was one penny, penny. And when I arrived in 1970 from Africa, that was a whole new concept. You could just go into a store and buy bubble gum. So it was pretty cool. So uh, they probably gleaned a couple hundred of my pennies. So anyway, this was a massive Halloween parade down College Avenue in 1959. This was the Park and Shop Grocery 
and that's the big Y uh, in um, Northeast College Place. And the Rose Street is right here on the left side. And that's all. <laughs> so, you can, you can find out about the rest of the history of College Place when the book comes out. Uh, the book will be out sometime in September. And uh, thank you very much for being attentive. And I appreciate you uh, coming and supporting this. If anyone has questions, we'll spend a couple minutes and I'll see if I can answer them. Yes? What about the creamery? So the creamery, uh, yes, I worked there as a student. <laughs> I worked at both ends of the creamery. Um, so the college dairy uh, was a very important business. And I got to interview Walt Meske, who arrived here in 1948, and he came here with not a dime in his pocket. And he came, and the only thing that led him into school was uh, the president of the college. And he said, I know you're a good hard worker, you can work at the dairy. And at the time, the entire college farm stood where the college church is now. And there was a chicken business, there was the creamery, and the cattle herd, and the milking parlors were all right there. So the school purchased 300 acres out west of College Place, moved all of that out in 1952, and started the college dairy farm out on that 300 acres, and the last portion of the school of the farm to be there in that site was the chickens. And it was run by a guy named Dean Lowen. And he was the manager of the chicken coop. And he eventually became the boys' dorm, a dean. And the interesting thing was he went from chickens to boys. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a... Uh, real business because they had, uh, they went out and they uh, sold milk, they sold ice cream, butter, and eggs. And that helped finance the school. It was very important for them. And the creamery eventually moved the packing portion of the creamery out from the college dairy on the 300 acres to town. And it sat right beside the college store and they had a cafe, and they had the packing plant, and you could order ice cream and milk, and then they had a distribution system, and my brother drove truck for the college dairy down to Pendleton and Weston and uh, Athena, and distributed college dairy milk all over that area. My job was, I helped run the store, the college store, and it was my job to count out all the tills for the next day. And so I got to meet all kinds of people. And I met some of the most interesting people and I could kick myself for not interviewing some of them. But I had no idea I was gonna do this project then. <laughs> but the amazing thing was I had individuals come in who were students here in the 1920s. And I had one lady come in and she says, listen, I'm a dime short. I'll just give you this token. It's from when I was a student here. And I thought, what's a dime? I'll pay the dime. So she gives me this token, puts it on the counter, and I was busy and I had a line of people. And I picked the token up, looked at it, looked like a brass token, threw it in this till, and didn't worry about it. So that evening when I went to count out the till, I picked that token up and looked at it, and it was a $3.1858 gold piece. And to this day, I have no idea who that woman was. And I would love to have returned it to her. But I never saw her again. And so when people hand you a token, <laughs> look at it. <laughs> so 
Anyway, that was uh, unbelievable. And I was stunned. So I went to the manager, who was a gentleman, uh, and I said, uh, so what do I do with this, Dean? And he says, well, you paid for it. I said, no, I didn't. I said, a dime was paid for this. I said, it's worth far more than that. So I went down to Rosica's in Walla Walla to get it, an estimate on it. And he said, well, right now gold is going for about $650 an ounce. And this is barely uh, a little over a half ounce. So he says, $300. I said, that's just the value of the gold. He says, it's only 18% gold. So he says, as a coin, it's fairly rubbed. So anyway, he didn't give it a very high mark. So anyway, I said, so how much would you pay for it? Oh, 50, 60 bucks. <laughs> I said, not in your life. <laughs> so anyway, we gave it to the college and I don't know what they did with it, but that was pretty amazing. Uh, some other amazing things that have happened in College Place with the dairy, and that was a gentleman took over the herd and he took on that herd of dairy cattle like they were his own beloved herd. And his name, uh, I'll think of it. But anyway, he was so careful. And when fair time came around, he always looked at the list of other cattle herds that were going to be at the fair. And if there were some herds there that he knew carried certain diseases, None of his cattle would go to the, to the fair that year. He was that careful. And he was our ultimate boss. And when he would walk in, <laughs> I'll never forget Dean, the manager of the college dairy store, it was like the colonel was coming. And he would say, get that picked up, clean that up, get ready. And we would all be in the store and he says, there's no fooling around, no joking. And so, <laughs> in would walk the uh, manager of the entire dairy. And he would walk in and he would run his fingers across the top of the canned goods on the shelves, look at it. He would go back to the packing plant, make sure all the machinery that they uh, put the milk cartons in were, was clean. Uh, he would open up these vats and look at the rings, the, the seals, and make sure they were clean. He was just fastidious about it. Anyway, one day we said, you know, this is not your herd. He says, as long as I'm manager, it's my herd. <laughs> and he believed it. And one day he lined us all up. I will never forget this. And he says, let me tell you something. When you are in a business and we are selling a product that can go bad very quickly and people can get very sick, he says, and we want those customers to live and enjoy this product. And he says, so we are going to take care of our customers in any way we can. And every customer is always correct. <laughs> you will not discuss or argue with a one of them. And if they say the milk is turned, it's turned, even though it may not be. He says, you take it back and you refund them. And so we would have people come in whose sniffer had stopped working. I think this is bad. I can't smell it. And he would say, give them their money back. It's not worth it. But he was an amazing gentleman. And uh, I always felt honored to be able to learn from him. That was outstanding. Some other things that happened in College Place that I will share with you real quick. Most of the students that came to Walla Walla College were blue collar kids. They were not from wealthy homes. Most of them were just like Walt Meske. And many of them didn't have two dimes in their pocket to go to school, but they worked. They would work 30 and 35 hour weeks plus a full load in college. So they were busy and there were no rows of sports cars out in the parking lot. These kids had beat up Model A's or Model T's. They had very little and they worked like dogs. 
and uh, that's what kept the college going. They were getting paid 18 cents an hour. Uh, when I arrived at college, I got 50 cents an hour. <laughs> so that was really, we were up there. So payment like that was, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't expect more than that. So the amazing thing was that mission, the word mission and missionary in College Place was very, very important because it was a Seventh-day Adventist facility and Seventh-day Adventists are great missionaries. And not only that, they are great uh, medical people. And so there were clinics and the Walla Walla General Hospital eventually sprung up in Walla Walla and it was directly because of the Dunlaps Sanitarium, which moved from College Place to Walla Walla. So the Dunlap Sanitarium became the Walla Walla General Hospital in Walla Walla. So amazing things happened and changes occurred in this valley because of the arrival of the city of College Place. And believe it or not, I interviewed several people whose ancestors were part of the group that did not want it to incorporate and they always brought it up. So, <laughs> thank you.